today I am talking to Professor Daniele Bolelli, who is very well known for lots of different reasons in and around martial arts, martial arts studies, martial arts documentaries, podcasts galore. He's like the king of the podcast. Daniele, how are you doing? Pretty good. What's going on with you? Uh, yeah, I'm okay. It's evening here. I've got my uh, lights on because it's dark and you guess you've just woken up there in California. I just woke up. Yes, I work late into the night usually, so morning is not my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, most people who listen to this podcast will have an inkling about you. Many of them will have your that book of yours uh, on the warrior's path. Mm -hmm. That first was published in two thousand and three, and I kind of we got to know each other around that book. Um, yeah. because yeah. I wrote a book about Bruce Lee and you wrote chapters on Bruce Lee in that book. And I kind of, I criticized some of your arguments and, and then you actually went to the trouble of turning up at my work office door. <laughs> that sounds scary, that sounds daunting. <laughs> <laughs> that was our first, uh, that was our first encounter. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, I remember that name. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> so tell us about the story of that book then was it was it first in italian and then in english or, yeah, or was it yeah i wrote it i mean it's ridiculous when i think about it because i wrote it when i was uh, it was originally published in italy in 1996 granted it was a different somewhat different version you know the 2003 version was already cleaned up and matured a <laughs> bit but i wrote that book when i was 22 so that's insane uh, on so many levels and uh and you know, I just thought, what do I, why do I like martial arts? Why do I, I'm so attracted? Why do I spend so many hours of my life uh, focused on martial arts? There's really no good practical reason for that for me, for the way my life is. Mm -hmm. So what the hell is going on? Why is, what is that drive? And so I just started toying with that idea and just figuring out, you know, breaking down a few different key elements for why that was. Mm -hmm. And just had a blood striking it, didn't think too much more about it. Then eventually I was, uh, you know, my English, well, my English is still awful as far as pronunciation goes, but as far as, uh, you know, command of the language, vocabulary and stuff, it, it eventually got pretty decent, mm -hmm. but it wasn't definitely in 1996. So it wasn't until, yeah, about 2003 when I actually had the skills to turn it into English. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is that, of course, anybody who has written in more than one language knows that it's a completely different beast. It's not a translation. You're redoing because the, the style changes completely. You know, Italian is long-winded and flowery. Every sentence is like 32,000 words, blah, 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 blah. English is much quicker and to the point. So... Um, but yeah, I was happy I did it in 2003 and then eventually because it, it did well as a book in 2008, they had asked me to do a second edition. So I added a couple of extra chapter to that edition mm -hmm. and, um, and that was that. And it's, is, it, is it one of your more famous books? Is it one of your most successful projects? Yeah, which is or? funny. Say something about the publishing industry because I wrote it when absolutely nobody knew me. I wrote it with no platform with no none of the scene that they tell you you need to have today to publish i had none of that and it sold way more than things i've done later where i had a huge audience in other ways where it just people buy books a lot less than they used to uh, there aren't the same chain bookstores where you walk in and you just can browse books and they keep books from you know years published years earlier they are still on the shelves all that stuff is kind of gone so whereas other form of media have become a lot easier to access, books are, uh, book readers are dying species, sadly, which... Well, I don't know. I mean, where it, I, what I've heard in terms of the, the sales around, around book sales around the pandemic and lockdown and stuff, it's like they've... Yeah, shot, yeah. Like bookshops yeah. are dying and now they're kind of... of no, now it's different. You know, pandemic is doing this bit in a second life. And, you know, maybe it's a good second life. Maybe it's a second life that lasts beyond the pandemic that is going to actually do something to it. So okay. hopefully that would be nice. Something about books, isn't there? And I want to I talk to you about books. I mean, one of the, the reasons I bought the book was because I was, 
I was I used to I studied and wrote about uh, political theory and cultural theory, but like you, my passion has always been martial arts uh, of almost any kind, and mm -hmm. and I was trying to work out the the importance of it in my life. So I wanted to write a book that I eventually settled on Bruce Lee, but it wasn't a Bruce Lee film book. It was about Bruce Lee as a figure yep. who had such a massive influence on so many different yep. aspects of culture. And so I turned to your book in order to find something to kind of spar with. Sure, so that was the, the, the status of it. I mean, I really, and, and I found it to be a really interesting book because um, even back then, you were pulling in philosophers, you're pulling in Nietzsche and you're pulling in European philosophy. And that was, that, that's not often done. People sometimes talk about the Stoics. They might mention Plato yeah. like wrestling, um, but you were pulling in ideas from your yeah. whole philosophical kind of range, weren't you? Absolutely. And I think that's something that, um, I was thinking about it recently, thinking about my father's life and his work and stuff. And that's something that I really learned that the, at the dinner table on a regular basis because his whole approach to knowledge was always to never specialize in one thing or one thing only was always somebody who could connect cultural words that most people keep separate mm. and so i was always fascinated with this idea of picking uh, uh, bringing words that normally are kept separate, bringing them to communicate with one another. And why should there be that a book about philosophy doesn't bring up martial arts? Or why does a book about martial arts can bring up philosophy? Or why doesn't it involve some pop cultural reference? Or why doesn't, you know, because ultimately to me, life is one and it speaks many languages. And so I find it interesting to be able to bring as many of these different languages as possible within something that ultimately is aimed at our quality of life. It's not aimed at, uh, uh, I want to talk just about martial arts. Mar even martial arts are in a way an excuse for something beyond it, for what it is that, how does martial art make my life better? Because ultimately that's what interests me, is the impact that it has on people's life, on their personality, on that kind of thing. If it happens to martial arts, great. But if you can pull it off through something else, who cares? As long as you pull it off, that's what counts. Mm. And you've always wanted to communicate across across contexts, haven't you? You've, you've, you've wanted to bring in the intellectual, the philosophical, and communicate that to the to as popular an audience as possible. But but navigating that line between you don't want to lose you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater you don't want to lose the philosophical complexity in order to, to so you don't dumb stuff down but you you've always wanted that popular accessible mode of address right yeah all things and we are chatting about it before we start a recording but yeah it's i want to slash that's all i know how to do <laughs> you know i uh, my experiences with academia, I just struggle, you know, it's just not the way my brain is wired. So when I read academic stuff, I, it's not that it's, uh, oh, I'm, because I prefer this other thing that I don't like, it is, no, I don't get it. <laughs> I just, the language, the structure, I just, it's, it's maybe where maybe we're two sides of the same coin, because like, you can, you can read Nietzsche and go, okay, and I can read Nietzsche and go, I, I, this doesn't mean anything to me. This is right. just crazy. But I can read about Nietzsche. I can read exactly. academics. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, Nietzsche is really interesting in this source uh -huh. of such. But to, when I actually pick up Nietzsche, I'm just like, what, what is this madness? I don't get it. And I think that's kind of what I mean when I say life speaks different languages. You know, they some of them, sadly, the academic one is the one that I seriously lack where I just, uh, and you know, there are degrees, because like when I read your stuff, I understand your stuff. But the most academic stuff, I struggle with, he heavily. Um, you keep it still, for lack of a better term, human enough, where I, under I see where you're going, I understand your arguments, I, <laughs> the language doesn't turn me off and all of that. But is, that all because, is that because mainly it's about, the martial arts and that's kind of leading you because you always know that what is on my mind is that's... love and this interest in these cultural questions and these intellectual questions about these practices that we that we love so much 
there's that for sure. I think also knowing you helps because then I can read through the lines a little better. I can make educated guesses of where you're going with some stuff and fill in what are blanks in my head because I'm lacking some stuff. And so then I read it. I'm like, oh, I know where he's going with this. So then, then all of that. And, you know, maybe maybe a writing style is done right different from some other academics. I don't know. But bottom line, it works for me. Most academic stuff, I really struggle. And so my thing of like wanting to popularize, as you say, is not popularized because I think that I'm in favor of dumbing down. It's just a particular language, you know, because to me it's like there are complex ideas there. They are just expressed in a way that's not a classic academic fashion just because I'm not capable of that, plain and simple. Mm. Okay, and you've always, but you, but, but yet, you, main, you maintain a commitment to the academic world. You're a university professor. You, you um, uh, have two podcasts uh, and you've appeared on like Joe Rogan's podcast and you've been a consultant for people like Robert Drysdale's book and his film and yeah. so on. So you, you, you don't walk, you never want to walk away from it, but, yeah. but you just kind of, you might look through the window, but you won't necessarily go into the, into the shop or something. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for, I love the, the principle of academia, you know, the idea of, uh, <clears throat> it, it's a beautiful place in a way, because you get to play with knowledge. You get to play with knowledge without having to deliver an immediate bottom line for an industry of some kind. That's a privilege. That's awesome. I like it. I do like that. It's just that I have a very immediate like in my mind, any kind of knowledge, any kind of writing, any kind of, you need to translate into wisdom quickly. And by wisdom, I mean something that has a positive impact on people's day-to-day -day life. So I'm completely, as you say, you know, I can read some weird Nietzsche thing and make it click as long as I can make it, as I can apply to life, as long as I can see a connection to how does this inform my life to make it better. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean dumbing it down, but it does mean bringing it to a bit of a nerdy level where it's like, okay, that was a cool theory. How does it apply here and now? How does it make anyone's life better? Okay. Um, and so because that tend to be my focus behind a lot of what I write, what I think, what I, the way I speak, it brings it back to a level that even people who may not understand the theory tend to understand the outcome, the practical result, the difference. And so that makes it just a little easier to communicate on, on a level with people who may not share the same, you know, who have not read all the same books, who have, don't have all the same cultural background, that, that kind of stuff. Like, to me, you know, you can take, uh, we can talk martial arts with a very well-educated university audience, and that's awesome. But I want to be able to talk about the same topic with somebody who comes straight from the ghetto and never read a book in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, and to <laughs> me, it's, a little tweak, but not even that much. Because ultimately, again, it needs to boil down to things that make a difference in real life that anybody experiences. As long as you breathe, you know what I'm talking about kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So which, I mean, if you're, um, if, if you uh, find this satisfaction from reading like different kind of philosophical traditions and for thinking them through in terms of martial arts and life, I mean, does, does Nietzsche help you on the mat? I mean, it, does it help you when you're training alone? I mean, what is there something about, with, you know, who's your favorite philosopher who's there in your head telling you, quoting lines from their books at you or something? Is there anything like that? I mean, uh, I definitely like Nietzsche a lot, even though I'm completely on board with you that, let's be real, Nietzsche was crazy at the end, uh, to look for a systematic philosophical to look for a system in Nietzsche, I'm a little suspicious of that kind of effort. I think Nietzsche was a poet genius where he has these flashes that are absolutely brilliant, but I wouldn't really try to bring back his philosophy to a perfectly rational, here is where it starts, here is where it's leading. I don't think that's Nietzsche, but again, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, one of my all-time favorite historical figures is uh, E.Q. Sojun, was a Zen monk from the 1400s, and his fantastic depth and yet light-heartedness at the same time uh, is completely endearing to me. And unlike the Nietzsche of the world, unlike the you know people like Caravaggio, like the tortured artist kind of thing, E.Q. had a beautiful quality which is this ability to be really deep 
while at the same time really enjoying life, really not having this, oh, my debt is a source of constant pain. I'm sure he struggled with it as he was young, but he grew kind of beyond it to a place where he just had a blast in life. Mm -hmm. He, you know, associated with people outside of the monastery in every possible way and just a great life. Mm -hmm. Huge impact on the Japanese cultural history. Some of his students became the teachers in things like created a tea ceremony, were key in the development of Kabuki theater, were key in like 10,000 different ways. Mm -hmm. And he just had a great time. And I like that sometimes to balance it, because you know, Nietzsche is really heavy and intense. Mm -hmm. And I think to balance it out with something a little more humorous and light-hearted and uh, and also that doesn't take itself so seriously mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's lots of there's a lot to think about Nietzsche but I want to I want to ask you about your life in in podcasting I mean um mm -hmm. I, I how so you were you were on the Joe Rogan experience quite like five years ago maybe or something and uh, I mean how did that so how did this thing come about where where you become the person that that these kind of this kind of celebrity martial arts culture they, they'll speak to you i mean how did what's that relationship how did that happen uh, luck i'll just plain damn luck what happened was um in 2011 um my life was going to crap in like 32,000 different ways it was just everything that could possibly go wrong was going wrong and at that time, though, in an effort to figure out what I was going to do next, how could I salvage some of the pieces of my life, I was, uh, I was in the middle of um, trying to finish a book. And uh, I had this book in mind about, which kind of took a Bruce Lee, JK, JKD approach to religions, you know, the idea of taking different ideas from different religions and creating the MMA of religion, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and I approached a publishing company and they were like, you know, that's great, but can you first write us, we have this series called 50 Things You're Not Supposed to Know About, can you write us some 50 funny stories about religion? And I almost took it insultingly, like, yeah. look, I'm delivering you something that to me is a big deal. And you say, yeah, yeah, that's great, but can you write us 50, 50 jokes kind of thing? I'm like... But, you know, I needed money. So I was like, sure, of course, if that's the price to pay to get the other one published, no biggie. And, you know, I had a good time. It was fun, but I don't really consider it my book because it's, you know, it's a fun exercise in writing. And... But uh, at that time, the publishing company had hired a guy to, to publicize it. And he did not work for Rogan at the time, but he was constantly tweeting him things and mm -hmm. Rogan was using some of his ideas and taking some of his scenes. So I don't know, must have been a slow week. Some guest must have fallen out or something. But when Matt um, told him, hey, there's this guy, I think you'll get along with him because there's martial arts, but there's also so many other things that you're into. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you would dig him. Rogan decided to have me on his podcast and it was very early on because uh, I think like now they are thousand whatever many episodes I think that was still in the hundred something I think it was 160 something so I show up and I have no idea what I'm doing because I never even know I, I never even heard of a podcast in 2011 you know stupid me but still I just didn't know Mm -hmm. So I remember showing up and there was Rogan's producer and I'm like, what the hell are we doing here? I mean, what exactly is a podcast? Yeah. And he's like, ah, it's kind of like radio, but you can cuss. I was like, great, perfect. We are going to get along. And, um, and, you know, we had a chat and I think Joe did back then, I like today that he has sometimes some very intellectual heavyweights. Most of his guests back then were mostly comedy. Mm -hmm. And he, I remember he made a big deal about the fact that I was teaching in college. Like he was like, whoa, this is going to be a big deal kind of thing. And I think he was pleasantly surprised that I wasn't too kind of killing his comedy vibe on the podcast that I was rolling with him. I was having fun with him. We were trading jokes. And then we would say something that was a little more substantial and people liked it. So then he had me on again and again and again and again. And so over time, I, he ended up having me on like nine times or something. Mm -hmm. But really, I think he was just dumb luck to be 
at the right place at the right time and then that one day things clicked and you know we got along and so he kept called me again and inevitably with rogan's popularity that means if he calls you then 20 other podcasts will call you to have you as a guest and then 20 more and so it becomes kind of a cycle with that okay so i'm just one of the t- i didn't call you because of joe rogan by the way i called right. you, i called you because of your book and because it would be nice yeah. to just catch up after so long like we we, we haven't seen each other yeah before, but um Absolutely. yeah so does it i mean has that had an impact on on the way that you think your your trajectory should go around writing or podcasting or broadcasting it, def- it had an effect yeah i mean it had a huge effect because the reality is uh you know, for me, writing was always it. I was always into, I want to write. But then one thing I realized, so when people after I've been on Rogan for a while or a bunch of other podcasts, they were all like, you should start your own podcast. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm so many other things going on. I have, I'm teaching, I'm trying to write, I'm doing this and that. But then I realized that as a medium, podcasting is something that people consume like there was no tomorrow like it was so much easier to get people to listen to podcasts than it was to read books or to do Mm -hmm. other things i was like huh just because i didn't foresee it doesn't mean that i shouldn't go down this path Mm -hmm. and so i started something rogan-esque that was more a podcast that was more interviews and chats and this and that and it was fun and all but Eventually, I started, after a while, I realized, okay, I teach history for a living. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite podcasts is a Hardcore History by Dan Carden. And um, I am already podcasting. How about I combine those things and create a history podcast? Mm-hmm. And that one, you know, took me a while to do it. it. took me probably a year and a half of preparation before I even recorded episode one, because, you know, I wanted to have enough material there not to run out immediately, because those... History podcasts are very research intensive. You need to become an expert on whatever you need to talk about. So you need to read ungodly amount of stuff. Mm -hmm. But eventually when I did that, that was the one that really hit. You know, other things I've done kind of worked. They were like, oh, this works well to a certain audience. This works kind of well. This one didn't. And the history podcast, for whatever reason, hit it huge, where it became a big 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 deal and so that changed dramatically the direction of my even now when i wanted to i was thinking of writing a new book a year or two ago and so suddenly the same literary agents that earlier wouldn't have cared for me because i didn't have enough a big of a profile now they're like oh history on fire of course please come on in uh, let me roll out the red carpet anyway it felt gross because i'm like i'm the same guy i was the day before and the other day i didn't come for anything and now suddenly you love me screw you <laughs> you know <laughs> just but but i understand that that's how that game works yeah and what about when you take that back into the classroom so you you're going to go and give a lecture you're teaching a seminar or something i mean do, do the other students aware of this or are you a different, a different, is it a different world? Yes and no. I mean, of course, most are not going to be, but then there are going to be the ones who have either have listened to History on Fire or maybe not History on Fire, but they've seen me on Rogan or something like that. And then there's a connection. And then I do use uh, some of the History on Fire episodes as assignments in the classroom because they are, you know, super in-depth research for with I don't know, four, six, eight hours of audio lectures on a particular topic. Mm. And they dig it because, you know, usually when you're doing history, you're doing a quick overview of a big stretch of historical period. Mm -hmm. You don't get to see history through individual eyes very much. Whereas by doing a deep dive on a single topic, you can afford to do that. You do have a you do get to see, you almost feel like a movie because you're seeing it through characters, you're seeing it through at a smaller level mm-hmm. and inevitably it's a lot easier to relate. So many students dig that. Mm-hmm. So will there be more books, I mean, or, uh, around martial arts or, or is it, is martial arts mm-hmm. now just your, just your personal life or, I mean, you know, is there going to be more publication, more research, more more essays and things about martial arts and philosophy maybe, or martial arts in life, I don't know. No, I think I wanna do, I think I wanna do fiction. Okay. I don't really wanna write nonfiction. And I don't wanna say anymore, cause you know, maybe something comes up and great. 
but uh, I've written all in all four nonfiction books. I'm happy with them. Okay. I don't have a particular call right now where I feel like I need to get this idea out in that fa- in that fashion. Mm-hmm. And I'm very interested in telling stories. I've always liked it, something I've always wanted to do. And I'm like, hey man, you're 46. What the hell? You haven't done it yet. When are you when do you mm-hmm. think it's gonna happen if you don't do it? So it's something I really want to do now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, in fact, I've just been cranking down like crazy with history on fire to get ahead a little bit and buy myself a little window of time to where I can dedicate myself to writing. Yeah. And uh, and that's kind of what I'm doing this month where I'm just, I just started writing a novel. I'm diving deep into that. And, uh, and that's really what I'm into. Excellent. That's, that's excellent. And then in your spare time, I noticed on your social media feeds, you're talking about you finally got around to converting your garage to a, you put some mats in it. Yeah. And your your partner is a, uh, she's a professional MMA fighter, yeah. is right? Yeah. So, so, so you're keeping your hand in with the, with the, oh, yeah. the, the physical. <laughs> of course. No, it's fun. I love it. You know, it's great to practice. It sucks these days for all of us because, of course, martial arts is the, one of the number one vehicles to pass germs to one another. So, yes, in COVID time, that's a bit of a problem and that's why everything is closed. So yeah, I'm mostly training at home, just training with my girlfriend, and um, that's kind of where it's at. But it's still better than not training. You know, I'll teach my daughter some stuff, or mm-hmm. but yeah, having a space right at home where you can get at least some semblance of training in helps a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what's it been like? So, so, so we're recording this in December yeah. 2020. This will probably go live in February 21. So maybe. Maybe we'll all have vaccines by then. Maybe we'll all right. be running again. But what's it been like over the last sort of eight months or so of seven or eight months of pandemic? Yeah. I mean, you know, especially changes from state to state. But in California, everything uh, gym-wise has been shut down since April. And that's kind of where it's at, where there's really no, no end in sight because realistically, of course gym environment is a prime spot to for the spread so has been definitely shut down continues to be shut down so i haven't really you know all this time since april all i've done is train with my girlfriend occasionally there have been a couple of people who have been swearing to me in 12 languages that they have been at home by themselves for the previous two weeks they have not so i'm like okay come by and we'll roll a little that's about it so that's the thing that has been fun and i noticed my girlfriend too that for her is hard because you know if you are gonna do that for real if it's not just a hobby but for her it actually worked out in a positive way because while yeah she can't get sparring on a regular basis other than with her coach who's also locked at home and only trains with her um it gave her time Mm. to really sit down and study the game Mm -hmm. to really sit down and study instructionals in a way that maybe she didn't have time when she was training all the time to really think more strategically about her game mm-hmm. and i've seen like i mean i remember rolling jujitsu with her and suddenly seeing her improve by 40 percent in the space of three weeks and i'm like how is that even po- it's not physically possible but like something clicked by watching things where suddenly she understood the game a lot better mm-hmm. and it translated to her actual practice in a dramatic fashion so I was like, look at that. You got a lot better during the pandemic. That's phenomenal. Mm. Yeah, that's that's good. I, th- I mean, nothing is all bad, is it? I mean, there's, there's ha- there have to be some bright sides to these things. And I, I guess, you know, when the dust settles and, and, and everyday right. life has changed and you're locked down, you really do have to find the new space that you're um that you're living in took me quite a long time as well to i find that i'm perfectly happy with my punch bags now and uh you know (laughs) my question is do i do i need to go back to a club and i think probably in the long term yes but i think i'm I'm fine through the winter but um daniele uh thank you for taking the time to have a chat to me i'm sorry for waking you up early and um <laughs> interrupting your writing it was nice to watch you go hang on a minute i just need to write down some dream thoughts that i had <laughs> okay i'll wait and, yes, you... and of course needless to say don't worry just because it's fiction doesn't mean it's not going to involve a hell of a lot of fighting because inevitably <laughs> that's where my brain goes so 
Uh, I'm actually thinking of doing, the plan is to do uh, historical fiction on the life of Caravaggio, the Italian painter, who was a straight up gangster, you know, <laughs> wanted for murder, killed a guy in a duel, uh, did all the, you know, very wild, one of the greatest artists ever, and at the same time, a really wild character. Yeah. To me, it's like doing a thing about Tupac, as if Tupac had been uh, an Italian painter, you know? Happy but, uh, but it's yeah. It's like a Tarantino film, isn't it? I yeah, mean, it really don't, is. Don't tell yeah. Tarantino about Caravaggio. <laughs> yeah. It's a blast, yeah. Okay, Daniele, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to talk to you, and uh, yeah, we'll hopefully be in touch again soon. Perfect, thank you so much, Paul.